I think it's our pleasure to welcome you for this symposium sponsored by uh, Canon Medical System. Uh, we will have uh, three presentations, three lectures. The first one is by uh, Antonia uh, Testa from uh, Roma. And uh, I let you introduce Antonia. Good. So welcome Antonia to the stage. Um, Antonia is a sonologist expert in gynae oncology who is based out of uh, Roma, and um, I've known her for a very long time. She's a great friend, and very excited to see you here today for the symposium. So we welcome you, Antonia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my chairman. Thank you for being here. And uh, I'm very grateful to Canon, because of giving us uh, the possibility to share our new experience, I would say. So. The title. The title was uh, Need for Advanced Tool in Gynecological Oncology. The, the, the answer is yes. So the role of ultrasound is absolutely known in the preoperative assessment of several oncological pathology. First of all, ovarian masses. Of course, the diagnosis between benign and malignancy but also in the assessment of the extension of the disease, a undisputable role also in the assessment of a cervical cancer as well as an endometrial cancer. A quite uh, still unexplored field is uh, the follow-up of our patients, so the role of ultrasound during follow-up. So nowadays, we have new approaches because, uh, in my view, our experience demonstrates that ultrasound can be relevant, not only in the preoperative phase, but also during, uh, during surgery as intraoperative approach. So we learned during the years, we learned a lot, a lot for instance, about borderline ovarian tumors. We understood how to make a suspicion of a borderline ovarian lesion. We understood how to follow up our patients. We are able to detect a very small lesion within the ovary, and we understood uh, the growth rate. Now, a clinical um, question, a clinical challenge. When we decide to remove a recurrent lesion for borderline during laparoscopy, how can we find it? How can we con do a conservative surgery? So in this patient, this was our first experience, this lady with a suspicious of recurrence of borderline tumor, here you can see the lesion, she underwent surgery, but the surgeon during laparoscopy saw this uh, situation. So he called us and we could demonstrate that this was simply a functional cyst. Can you see the instrument pushing against the lesion? Uh, this was another functional lesion. Then we guided the surgeon to define where the normal ovarian parenchyma was located, and it was there. And again, we defined with him where the tumor was located. And you can see the tumor there. In this patient, the surgeon decided anyway to remove the two functional cysts, despite my diagnosis. And they turned out to be benign. And uh, he could remove the tumor there. So this was our first experience. In the literature, Yazep and colleagues they reported uh, their experience by using ultrasound during surgery in uh, patients with uh, suspicions of borderline recurrence. And they demonstrated that it could be very useful in facilitating the complete tumor excision. So after that experience, we started a pilot prospective study. The aim was to um, analyze in how many cases uh, the surgeon could require the assistance of an ultrasound examiner in completing the surgical procedure only by laparoscopy. 
to find a recurrent lesion. This is the scenario and this is the aim. So we analyzed uh, 51 patients and uh, the examiners was invited to go to the surgical theater in 12 cases. And we, it was very useful in all of them to guide the surgeon to find the lesion when he, she was in difficulty. So, just to a, a clinical aspect, to be able to do that with a minimal invasive surgery is very relevant because uh, um, in uh, that situation, you can also perform hyperthermic intralaparotomy chemotherapy. And nowadays, we know that the outcome of these patients is absolutely similar to those operated on laparotomy. So no different outcomes and a great advantage for, for intraperitoneal uh, chemotherapy. So, with this great enthusiasm, we went on with the different approaches, with the different applications, and in particular, we guided the surgeon with the both transabdominal and transvaginal approaches, but we also used these laparoscopic and finger probes. You see here the laparoscopic probe. You can move the probe, you can rotate the angles, or you can use the finger probe during laparotomy surgery to guide, to look for some particular um, structure. There is an ongoing prospective study in our institutions. Since last year, we analyzed 65 cases, and you can see that uh, the most frequent pathology is a malignant pathology, but we could also apply that in benign conditions. So we prepared a list of uh, different applications. First, borderline. Second, recurrent deep pelvic lesion, retroperitoneal lesion. This is uh, not found at open surgery and also benign conditions. So let's start again from, um, with the first one. Again, borderline. This is a quite interesting case because as you can see, the peritoneal cavity was negative, so no carcinomatosis, and uh, the ovary was stuck to bowel. So after removal of the adhesions, we saw the, the adnex over there, but we used the laparoscopic probe to localize a very small recurrent lesion. This is the recurrent lesion, a very small unilocular solid lesion and we could discriminate this lesion from this one. She was ben it was benign, and this is the, the normal ovarian parenchyma. So the surgeon could remove this very small recurrent lesion, and then we could check again the normality of uh, the remaining ovarian parenchyma. An example of recurrent deep pelvic lesion, where after surgery, after radiotherapy, after sometimes you start with laparoscopy, but the pelvis is obliterated because of severe adhesions. So in these patients, um, the woman underwent surgery because uh, there was a detection at PET-CT of this small lesion deep in the pelvis. And the surgeon couldn't detect it, so we guided it. Uh, by using the transvaginal approach, you can see here the instrument, so we guided the surgeon to find it. And another application is for the retroperitoneal. If you have some recurrent lesion, again, detected the PET CT, magnetic resonance, and so on, during laparoscopy, sometimes the peritoneal cavity is completely free. The surgeon they do not know where to open, where to go, where to find it. And this lesion was absolutely attached to the sacrum bone. So we guided the surgeon and they couldn't find it. And it turned out to be a neurinoma. This case, another application. The patient was diagnosed a advanced ovarian cancer. And so he, she, was, she underwent surgery 
in order to obtain an optimal cytoreduction, but at CT scan two lymphonodes were detected there. So, during surgery, after optimal abdominal cytoreduction, it was critical to find those two lymphonodes. And the decision was, shall we open the diaphragm or not? Because they were supposed to be two cardiophrenic lymphonodes. So we went there, we could localize the two lymphonodes. Now they are coming. And so, one and the other. So we could guide again the surgeon to find both of them. And now there is a one minute video so you can see the diaphragm and the surgeon could overcome the diaphragm to reach them. And it could be a very bad clinical condition if the surgeon would have left these two localization of the tumor. So this is one. So you can see one transdiaphragmatic surgical approach. And both of them resulted to be infiltrated. Okay, one second again. You see the dimensions are not so large. Okay. And then we used ultrasound examination again, intraoperative, just to check that uh, the surgery was absolutely complete. And this is the histopathological findings. Now, so oncology is the main application for us, but uh, we did it, uh, we used it also in benign conditions. In this patient, the surgeon was doing myomectomy during um, laparoscopy, but at the end, he knew that there was a deep myoma. He wanted to continue um, in laparoscopy, but uh, you know, during laparoscopy, you don't have the tactile feeling. So it's, sometimes it's difficult where to open, where to find it. So they could complete surgery uh, with the ultrasound guide. And uh, the final example um, is this one. Uh, the patient underwent surgery because of a lost intrauterine device. So at X-rays, the intrauterine is defined uh, device was um, detected uh, under the liver. But during mini laparotomy, they couldn't be able to find it. So in this case, uh, transabdominally, we could uh, uh, scan again the, the, the abdomen, so we could localize the, the device, and we could tell them, pay attention, the device is the, in the bowel wall. So at the end, they could find it. It was in the bowel bone. So need for advanced tools. Can we do something more? A few words uh, just to mention a very new advanced tool, that is uh, the combination of magnetic resonance and ultrasound in the so-called fusion imaging. We can call it real-time virtual sonography. The equipment is very simple. You have your machine, you can, you can see on your screen magnetic resonance and ultrasound, and simply you have a control unit, a transmitter, a receiver, and as soon as you have uploaded magnetic resonance, you have synchronized the two examinations, you can navigate. And in the literature, there are some communications about fetal anomalies, prenatal diagnosis. There are some data about our tumors. What about uh, gynecologists? There are some data on feasibility, uh, looking for adenomyosis and assessing endometriosis. And cervical cancer, some data about fusion um, of uh, magnet resonance and PET-CT and uh, this one, uh, transrectal ultrasound and CT. So we decided to do a study on cervical cancer patients. 
So, just um, very simply, what uh, does it work? With the three anatomical reference points, first, you have to find the anatomical landmarks, you have to synchronize the magnetic resonance at the planes, and then you can navigate. Now, this is an example of a lady with this cervical cancer, magnetic resonance and um, ultrasound. After synchronization, you can check the paracervical infiltration, is there or not. Another example, this is the uterus and the tumor, magnetic resonance and ultrasound. Okay. So far, in our prospective ongoing study, we uh, aimed at assessing the feasibility of the methods. We analyzed 26 uh, patients uh, with this FIGO stage, and we demonstrated that the combination of real-time ultrasound magnetic resonance, first of all, is feasible. And uh, the duration is about 50 minutes. And just to give you some examples, this one. Okay, in this patient at magnetic resonance, it was, to me, much clearer, the lesion. Not so clear, quite unusual at grayscale on uh, ultrasound. In this patient, the lesion was located posteriorly and the fornix was obliterated. So we did uh, fusion and uh, we were, um, of course, both of them confirmed uh, the obliteration of the vaginal wall, but there were uncertainty about uh, the paracervical infiltration. At the end, navigating together the radiologist and the ultrasound examiners, we decided that here there could be a minimal paracervical infiltration. So the surgeon decided to perform surgery, and this is the counterpart, the anatomical counterpart of the paracervical infiltration. Vice versa, in this patient, this is uh, the magnetic resonance image. As you can see, it's very difficult to detect the lesion. That appears quite clear on ultrasound. So again, we could together be able to identify and to assess the parametral infiltration or not. So perhaps uh, I used too much time, sorry. Advanced tools, do we need that in oncology? Yes, we need it. And uh, I think that uh, intraoperative surgery is absolutely relevant. And in the next future, we will see more and more and more applications. What about fusion? My impression is that for sure, it has a great academic value. What does it mean? It means that the first time, for the first time, we really spend together time in the same rooms. Trainees from radiology and trainees from gynecologists. And that's a great advantage for both of them to grow up together. Otherwise, we do not learn how to examine magnetic resonance and they are not able to scan our patients. Thank you so much. Is there any question from the audience for Antonia? Antonia, do you think that fusion will increase our diagnostic accuracy, or it is more something which is important for teaching yes. and for trainees? So it's more diagnostic, or it's more yes. an academic tools uh, in your mind? Yeah. I'm very happy that uh, a radiologist is the chair of our session, so I would like to make the question to you. <laughs> I really believe uh, that it's uh, so important. We can increase uh, the accuracy, and uh, because sometimes, you know what, in, uh, for cervix, we say, okay, there is invasion, but on magnetic resonance, we are look at the left, right, left up ventral side, and magnetic resonance is looking at another side. So it's really important uh, to be together. And uh, the accuracy, for me, will be absolutely better. Thank you. In the cases where you had videos of uh, intraoperative laparotomy, ultrasound, digital probes being used, 
who's driving that in where you're working? Is that driven by the sonologists or is that driven by the surgeons, that technology? Sorry. I'm not sure to have so clear. During so, surgery, when you use it? Yeah, so the actual concept that there's intraoperative ultrasound yeah. looking at um, diaphragmatic lymph nodes or yeah. to look for the, where the borderline lesion is, is that something that has been uh, led by the surgical team or is it led by you, the sonology team? Um, half and half. Okay. Half and half. Because at the moment, we are... Um, still very experienced surgeons, oncological surgeons, and very experienced ultrasound examiners. The new generation, in my mind, they could be rich, both expertise. So, so far, they do not understand clearly ultrasound, so they have to trust us. And they, at the same time, they are the leader. So, we are doing together. Excellent. Thanks so much, Danielle. Thank you. We have the chance to have a lecture by uh, Juliana Carvalho uh, from uh, London. She's uh, one of the most well-known leaders in the field of fetal cardiology. So today she will speak about what do you expect from early fetal echography. Thank you, Juliana. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for being here at lunchtime. Um, I don't know how many of you are going to be able to jump from gynecology to early fetal echocardiography, quite different subjects, but I'll try and make it a little bit interesting for you. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of background, and I put a timeline here, which spans back to 1985, because prior to 1998, which I'll tell you why 1998, uh, early fetal echo was done by obstetricians, Cardiologists were not interested in fetal cardiology at that stage, and they were all done transvaginally, but that's not a good thing for cardiologists. We don't like to be putting a transvaginal probe, and now if we do it every so often. So in 1998, uh, it's my first publication about first trimester fetal echocardiography, but there was transabdominal, and there was a small series of the very first 15 patients that I'd seen over a relatively long period of time. And that was done in high-risk pregnancies. So that is, I dare to say, nearly 20 years ago, or past 20 years ago, because it was April 1998, so it's over 20 years, that I started doing transabdominal fetal echocardiography. And I can count in my two hands how many times I've used transvaginal during this time period. And if I do, I do get an obstetrician or gynecologist to do that for me. So I was looking back at that publication, and um, it was int interesting to see how much 20 years ago we set as the establishment for normal fetal echo, which was establishing abdominal situs, which has only recently came to the ISWA guidelines, so we're doing this for more than 20 years. Cardiac position, four chamber view, two valves, uh, atrioventricular valves, two similar sized ventricles, to see the two great arteries in a normal spatial relationship, and to document any additional features. So 20 years ago, we were quite demanding already before we could say this, this scan was normal at less than 14 weeks gestation. And of the additional things that we were looking, which we didn't include initially in the methodology, was to see the septoaortic continuity, because if you see that, you exclude tetralogy of fallow as well, where all the other features could be relatively normal. So we had quite a lot of cases where we'd seen that. So I, unfortunately, the digital era was different, and although the, the images I had were in color, if you look at the PDF, they all represented this terrible black and white. So the images we were getting 20 years ago were better than this here, when you actually pick up the print version. But then I was painstaking to demonstrate everything here. You can see the four chamber, the aort and the SVC, and the IVC in the umbilical system. So that was, you know, everything we had to see, transverse views and sagittal views in this small series. And I started from there. And over the years, uh, I've been doing more and more first trimester and early second trimester, because I'm including here up to 16 weeks of gestation. So around that time, there was a lot of interest to see, well, what can we see early in the pregnancy? So there were a few studies, which is back more 2002, the two studies. One is from uh, uh, Monique Huck in, uh, in, in the Netherlands, uh, demonstrating that 
each week of gestation makes a big difference as the quality of the information you get. So below 20 week, sorry, below 12 weeks, it's quite hard to get information that is diagnostic. You can see the heart, maybe you see a four chamber with the ventricles, but we need to see more than that in order to be able to counsel the families. And that matched up quite nicely with the clinical impression that 13 weeks to start is better than 12 weeks transvaginally or transabdominally. And then there was a work from Ian Huggan, who was at King's at that stage, and it's basically showing that the, the bigger the baby, the bigger the CRL, the more successful the exam, the larger the lady, the less successful is the exam, which goes along with the 20 weeks again as well. So there are some limitations which are the same. And this is a cartoon which will show you uh, comparatively the size of the heart at 13 weeks, because around the heart there are the lungs in that specimen, and the one euro cent, one cent of the euro. So you see the size of the structures we're trying to image at 13 weeks of gestation. And the chest diameter is only one inch, two and a half centimeters at around 13 weeks. And the aortic valve just measures about 1.3, 1.4 millimeter at that stage. So it, we can see that from this case is a simple transposition. The image uh, are from about 15 years ago. It's my first case of uh, first trimester transposition was coming from a, a nuclear translucency of nine millimeters. And you can see here the parallel arrangement of the great arteries. And this fetus is now around 15 years old and had had a, an arterial switch operation. So I think if we move from that historical background and in 2018, what are the expectations of early fetal echocardiography? Uh, and I think I'd like to differentiate here two aspects. One is screening, uh, which I put a bird here, which is quite difficult to see the details because you may see something is wrong, but perhaps not enough to see what is wrong exactly to be able to counsel the families. And that's where uh, a cardiologist or someone that's very interested in the fetal heart uh, can come to a scanning or obtaining more details, and then you can clarify the details of the scan, which are important in terms of counseling. So that's what I do is the scanning, I don't do the screening. So at this stage, uh, point in time, what is our threshold? That is what I establish on a uh, daily basis because I scan a lot of patients below 16 weeks, of, 16 weeks of gestation. And there is a minimum that I need to see to say this is fine at 12 to 16 weeks. And it's basically almost everything that you see on your 20 week scan, normal situs, so, uh, normal cardiac position, we have to see the four chambers, we have to see the two atrial ventricular valves, the two semilunar valves, the ventricles need to be symmetrical. We need to see the two great arteries, we need to see them in the normal position, we need to see the connections, that they're all in the correct place. Uh, we need to see that the flow velocities are normal, we need to measure at least the aortic and pulmonary valves, and that they are within the normal range. And the main limitation is the view of the septum, to rule out ventricular septal defects. So we have to have at least reasonable views of the ventricular septum to rule out an overriding aorta to exclude tetralogy of phallus. So it's quite a long list, but that's part of a fetal echo. So it's not if you go to the first trimester or early second trimester, that should be part of what you do every day anyway. So just on a few uh, slides here, a few images. That is an image of the situs, which is similar to the cardiac guidelines, a four chamber view. This is a 13 weeks and one day. Uh, you see the, the ventricles here. The use of color is important because you can see the you can see here the ventricular septum, excluding major VSDs in the inlet portion. Then we have a, a slightly a sagittal view showing the aortic valve here and the septal aortic continuity. And so I just want to go to that slide, and I'll show you more of those images which uh, I call them just flow. This is used with conventional uh, ultrasound equipment. And you see here the inferior vena cava, the superior vena cava coming down, the aortic arch, and the ductal arch. So it's a 13-week scan transabdominally. Uh, we measure the aortic and pulmonary valve. As I said, they measure about 1.4 millimeters. We measure the velocities across the valves to see that they're working well. And we measure tricuspid and, and tricuspid mitral valve Doppler inflows. So it's, it's, it's really a complete fetal echo. That's what we should set as our minimum to see, to say that the heart is normal. 
So there are the things that we don't always see, but we try and see them. And, and that's something that's changed because equipment's getting better. So more often than not, we do see the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava. Uh, we'll see the pulmonary veins as well earlier in the pregnancy. So these are not a must, but are desirable things to see um, on, a, on an early fetal echo. Umbilical venous return is very easy to see. Dr. Zanozo, we should look for that as well. I put a question mark here on what the obstetricians are looking for more often, which strike us with regurgitation, subclavian arteries, because they're looking at that for risk of chromosomal abnormalities, and I'm not that interested on that. I'm more interested to see that is the structure of the heart normal, and if the tricuspid regurgitation is there, but the tricuspid valve is normal, uh, it doesn't really matter. So the additional information you can see here, again, the same scan of 13 weeks. We have the inferior vena cava joining the right atrium. We have the superior vena cava coming down and joining the right atrium. On a color here, we have the main pulmonary artery and the bifurcation, pulmonary veins coming into the left atrium with a normal Doppler signal and the ductus venosus. So I think the, the threshold is quite high. So let's have a look at a few examples of what we can achieve. And I'm putting here the BMI because you might say, oh, well, you're just choosing the best image you have. You know, what is it in everyday life. Well, there are difficulties as well, uh, but we, we try and overcome them as much as possible. So this here, BMI of 23, uh, 14 weeks gestation. Um, the position was normal, so we start with the situs, um, and we come up to a four-chamber view, and the left ventricular outflow tract. And if you're used to looking at this very often, you can see the details very quickly. If you're not, you probably need to play that time and time again. So in a very quick sweep, you can see that all the structures are there and the connections are normal. And this is without using color. On a sagittal view, you see the diaphragm, the stomach, a short axis view. You can see the papillary muscle, the mitral valve. We see here the aortic arch, good contractility, two ventricles. And of course, we have to add color. It's, we can't do any scans, second trimester, first trimester, any trimester without color. It gives information about the flows, but it also makes it easier to see the anatomy, particularly if you're not used to doing scans. So here we have the sagittal view with the IVC coming up into the right atrium. We have the aortic arch, and you can see that the aortic arch looks normal, so it's easier to see. Uh, you would agree with me than in the 2D image that I showed before, and we use both a combination of the two. And I quite like to use this. I call it just flow. I've been using this for you know, more than 10 years. Uh, you don't need any sophisticated equipment. You just turn down your B mode gain when you put in the color and adjust the color for the, the gain for the color setting. And, and you get an image which looks like an angiogram. Um, and you can see here the gain is a little bit high. But you can see that decreasing the velocity, you can see the branches of the aorta, the aortic arch coming here. You even see pulmonary veins coming here on the back of the left atrium. And there are different kinds of color uh, with higher definition and sometimes more sensitive for the uh, low velocity in these in this vessels. And this is against the same, the same features as the 14 weeks. This is all transabdominal, just using standard ultrasound equipment, but they have a high definition flow. And you can see the great details of the aorta, the branches of the aorta, the umbilical vein would come in here, the inferior vena cava. And if we are a bit lucky of stopping it, you can even see the atrial appendages at one point. I think it's towards the end. Here we have the right atrium in the front with the atrial appendage and the left atrium on the back with a different atrial appendage. So there are lots of details you can see. We don't look for that. Obviously, this is an extremely nice, slim woman with um, a baby in a good position. And this is mainly showing that similar image, but we have to start with here, right at the beginning, more in the inferior vena cava, and the superior vena cava coming here, inferior and superior vena cava. So you can see a lot of the anatomy very, very early on. Now, well, let's change. Now we have a 15-week, and the BMI is not 20 or 25, it's a BMI of 34. So people would say, well, how are you going to see anything on a BMI of 34 at 14, 15 weeks of gestation? Obviously, the image quality is sometimes very good, but you have to accept that the quality may not be the same, but you still need to get the information. And I start this clip here with a, a longitudinal view of the left ventricle. So left ventricle here, aortic valve and aorta, left atrium behind, right ventricle in the front. 
And then we come here, we see the four chamber, we see very clear septoiotic continuity in the right ventricular outflow tract. So we can see that all the connections are normal. So if this is a high nuclear translucence, you know there is no major abnormality. So it's very reassuring. And of course, we use color. This is the same, uh, the same fetus. And we are more in a sagittal view, showing here the ductal arch and the aortic arch. And it kind of the fetus moves a little bit, and you get your, your V sign of the position of the vessel. You have the SVC. You have flow through the, the two ventricles there, flashing symmetrical ventricles, so you can get the same information with quite good views, I would say, for BMI of 34 at 15 weeks of gestation. And of course, if you use this, not technology, but just a, a hint of how to improve your image, you can get this is the same 34 BMI, and you can see that we still get the same beautiful aortic arch. Not, not all of them are like that, but it is not impossible to get that kind of information on a high BMI. And it's still the same fetus. And you can see how I don't need to describe the whole anatomy anymore. You can see all the branches of the aorta, beautiful aortic arch, the two ventricles coming here, uh, the umbilical vein, the ductus venosus, a bit of the IVC. So all the anatomy is there uh, quite early in the pregnancy. So that is normal. And so that's what we should aim to get beautiful images, which we don't always get, the same problem in the second trimester, but we should always get the same information. I, all that list of things I pass on to you with suboptimal image or excellent image, the information needs to be there. So we really need, if you're doing fetal echo, uh, as a cardiologist, you need to not just find the problem, because that comes from the obstetrician, from the sonographer. They think there is a problem. My job is not to say, yes, I agree there is a problem. My, my job is to say the problem is X, Y, and Z, define and counsel the family. So we have to define the problem. So I'm going to show you just a few examples of abnormalities um, and see how um, the images are compared to that. So this was a, a relatively low BMI, 23 normal BMI who presented because of increased nuclear translucency. The fetus was hydropic. She declined an uh, CVS, amniocentesis. Um, by the time she came to me, she was 15 weeks, the hydrops had resolved. So she came to me, increased NT hydrops. Now the baby could have had an IUD, but I put the probe, uh, hydrops had gone, which for her was good because she didn't want to have any invasive tests because she was obviously want the pregnancy. So we start here with a four chamber view and you can see there's a little bit of uh, dissimilarity between the ventricles, the left ventricle on the side, the right ventricle a bit hypoplastic, uh, but measurements within the normal uh, range, but just some asymmetry, tricuspid mitral valves. We'll see that there is a, a ventricular septal defect. You just see the color flashing here. So there must be a relatively large ventricular septal defect to be able to see that at 15 weeks. Small defects, we're not going to see them very easily. And if I follow through again, you see that the vessels are in a normal relationship, left ventricle here, aorta coming up, pulmonary artery coming from the front, three vessel trachea view, and there is an asymmetry at the arteries as well. So it's slightly unusual because it's the right ventricle that's a bit smaller, but it is the aorta that's a bit smaller. So uh, the ventricle is the right and the arteries is on the left side. But no critical lesion. These are all amenable to surgery, so it's good news for her to be able to reassure to that extent at 15 weeks. And again, our kind of just flow information, you can see here the ductal arch and the aortic arch where it thins down, there's a bit of ismo hypoplasia. At that stage, we're cautious, maybe the baby's going to have coarctation. Uh, most of what we see here is the ductal arch or the head and neck vessels. So all very uh, treatable uh, postnatally. And as the pregnancy went on, the aorta kind of uh, reshaped better, and eventually the degree of suspicion of coarctation was quite low, but the baby still had a very large VST, and uh, it developed quite well, and obviously the hydrops had resolved quite early on in the pregnancy. So you, can, you are able to reassure those families quite early on, but you need to follow them through up to at least the second trimester, uh, and in this case, obviously, suspicion of coarctation would follow her all the way through the uh, end of pregnancy. This is another example, 14 weeks, again BMI 24, but spine up, spine is on the top here, lots of uh, skin edema as you can see here, baby hydropic. Um, I don't think we had the karyotype on this one as we're scanning up and down. You see there's some uh, pleural effusion as well and it's clearly here, even with the spine on the top, 
that we have a complete atrioventricular septal defect, yeah? common valve, large primary ST, and a large uh, ventricular septal defect. So some of the technical things, you can still come across that and be able to uh, get the information. Now, I would say 98% of the time, we do get sufficient information at this stage. Another lady, 13 weeks, BMI 23, retroverted uterus, um, difficult to scan from the obstetric point of view. They suspected a hypoplastic left heart. When I went to scan her, I left this image here so you can see there was at least eight centimeters in terms of depth from her abdomen and the placenta in the front. You can just see the heart here. And then magnifying everything, putting that image bigger, she did not want to have a, a CVS. It was a precious pregnancy. It was an IVF after multiple miscarriages. So, you know, suspicion of hypoplastic left heart, you have to be very, very accurate because this was a hypoplastic left heart, as you can see here. There's one, one chamber only, but that could have been something else with one chamber that the prognosis is better. You see here the atrial septum relatively thick, the left atrium behind, a very small left ventricle and a big right ventricle. There was some tricuspid regurgitation as well, but that doesn't tell me this is a hypoplastic left heart. So that's when we have to refine the diagnosis. This image tells me there is aortic atresia because we are here at the level of the three vessel view when we can see forward flow through the pulmonary artery in blue and reversal of flow in the transverse aortic arch. So this is very, very diagnostic and with huge implications for the family. A family, a woman that did not have a CV, want to have a CVS, uh, at the moment that we confirmed that this is hypoplastic left heart syndrome, she opted for termination of pregnancy because the results are not very good. So you cannot make, cannot get this diagnosis wrong because it does have huge implications for the family. So I'm just about to finish. I'm just going to show a more or less similar case in terms of when he was referred to me. And these are images uh, obtained by an obstetrician at 14 weeks. And this lady had had a, a high risk in the first trimester, had a nucleotransluscency of 2.6, uh, and went for this scan to try and see, you know, does she do an NIPT? How does she manage this high risk? So we can see here the ductus venosus, there's no reverse wave, but high pulsatility. There was a bit of tricuspid regurgitation. That there was always two images from the obstetric scanning, and they, they could just see one, apparently one chamber, and some regurgitation here. So she was heavily counseled for, we can only see one chamber. This is either a hypoplastic left heart or an atrioventricular septal defect, which have completely different implications in terms of prognosis. Um, offered her CVS. Uh, she, I think she declined to have a CVS. I can't quite remember that. No, she had a CVS. Uh, the PCR was normal. So the Down syndrome, which was a concern with an AVST or hypoplast. So she came to me at 15 weeks, and I thought this is not a hypoplast left heart. But at that stage, I needed a bit more of information. And that's one of the points I want to make. We have to see have I reached my threshold? Have I seen everything I need to see? If not, it's better to delay the diagnosis. Like in this case, I said to her, I, it's not a hypoplast left heart, but to fully counsel you, I need a bit more of information. Come back in two weeks. So she came back at 17 weeks. In the time scale of her lifetime, but two weeks is not important. So early fetal echo is very important. But if you don't have sufficient information, which could completely change the prognosis for that baby, you do need to be honest and say, we need another two weeks to see the information. And, and this here uh, is quite a complex heart, but you see here the two atria, they're different in size. The left ventricle is smaller, but it's not hypoplastic. We had flow to the mitral valve. Then we have a big vessel coming here. Uh, if you're not used to fetal echo, you might find it difficult to um, follow. So I'm just gonna try and show you a little bit slowly. So we have, uh, on a four chamber view, we have flow to the mitral valve on the bottom. And then we have, I'm gonna skip a little bit here. We have one big vessel coming off that big right ventricle, which is here, the blue one is the, a big vessel. Now the question is, is this the aorta or is this the pulmonary artery? Is this a hypoplastic left heart or not? And then you see that vessel coming here. It turned out that this is a big aorta. That's the trachea, or the right side of the aortic arch. And then as we carry on, you see that from that, the flow is coming in the wrong direction. So it was uh, not hypoplast. 
We had a right side aortic arch with a left side arterial duct, reversal flow, and pulmonary atresia. So it's still a complex heart, but the treatment is completely different. And this baby eventually uh, was born, had a shunt initially, and is on the pathway for having a biventricular circulation, which is completely different. So uh, the implications early on in the pregnancy are great. For certain families, they, they would do everything for having, even the baby needs to go through surgery to have a, a relatively good outcome at the end of the day. And this is my last slide. I just want to leave a message, and I've used this a few times. I apologize if you've seen before. If you haven't seen, it's a bit of a challenge because there are two pictures in this image, which I hope you can appreciate. Uh, there is there's a couple looking at the horizon, but you also have the fetus, the whole body there, with the legs and the profile and the hands. Um, so I think my message here is, you know, pregnancy, a couple looking through the horizon, they're looking through a lifetime of experience. Everyone has expectations, and we have to be very accurate. I think that's the main message. Uh, at the point of delivering a complete fetal echo and a fetal cardiology counseling, because whatever you say to the family has huge implications for the future of that family and of that child. So we need to be very certain of how we, we deliver that information to the families. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Shirina, for the reason of time. We'll move to, uh, to Jada. If you have some questions for Juliana, feel free to, to ask her directly. And uh, Jada is from uh, Lisbon. Uh, he's well known uh, in uh, vital medicine, and especially also in art in the first trimester. And he will present a small communication about uh, the role of uh, first trimester ultrasound in the CNS3 DNA area. Thank you, Jada. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Keno Medical for the opportunity to be here. And I would also like to make it easy for all of you that uh, I, 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 I'm in the position where I'm either just before your lunch and so you're starving, or right after your lunch, so you're half Sleep. So I will make this communication very, very, very short, uh, right to the point. Is that there? Oh, okay, it's there. So you can actually uh, uh, pay attention to it a little bit more. So I, I was challenged to, to, with a question if there is still a role in the ultrasound in the cell-free DNA area. So for the ones that want to sleep, the question is yes. Uh, the, the, the answer to the question is yes, of course, there is a lot of things that you can still do and you need to do uh, with ultrasound, even that though uh, we are living in an in a era where you have uh, cell-free DNA for screening, for fantastic screening for trisomy 21, 18 and 13. Um, we learned from, from, from the principle of the inversion of the pyramid of care from, from, from uh, Professor Kipros Nicolaidis that we, the first trimester ultrasound is much more than just looking at nuchal translucency, nasal bone, tricuspid regurgitation, and ductus venosus, but now we amplify this ultrasound scan so you can actually look at fetal defects, preeclampsia, uh, oh, sorry, screen for, uh, for preeclampsia, fetal growth restriction, premature birth, and, it, and still for aneuploidies because in a, a small, small, but in a certain proportion of the patients that undergo cell-free DNA tests, they don't, they don't have any result. Uh, I'm not going through all of this. I'm going to focus on fetal defects and preeclampsia, which I think are I'm not, uh, which I think are very important, a little bit more important, I consider, than any other uh, of the other things, especially because fetal growth is still not very good in, in screening so far. So on the fetal defect, uh, you can tell me that, well, it's easy to, to identify if you also use the markers for trisomy 21, but even in the babies that we have uh, no chromosomal abnormalities and you find no, no other marker, this is a study from, from, from the group of Professor Katia Bilardo that shows us that uh, within 5,000, a little bit more than 5,000 patients that were screened in the first trimester, 51 of the structural abnormality found was found without correlation with uh, chromosomal abnormalities. And of those 51, 23, so uh, which means 45% of them uh, were 
uh, diagnosis in the first trimester ultrasound. And within this 45%, within this 43, all of those ones on the side that you can see, acrania, holoporosis, encephaly, gastroschisis, exonfalus, megacystis, and body stock anomaly, that are considered to be always detectable by the publication from the group of Professor Nicolaitis in 2011, all of those uh, are inclusive. So, uh, there is a role in looking at, uh, um, at an anatomy, looking for structural abnormalities, even uh, if you're not considered chromosomal abnormalities. Of course, there is an impact even for the patients that undergo cell-free DNA tests, because in patients where you do an ultrasound and you find a major structural abnormalities, like the ones you can see there, the one on the top, I cannot point actually, for some reason I don't have my pointer. Uh, the one on the top there, holoporosis encephaly, the one on the side of the one that is uh, exonfalus, then a megacystis and uh, cardiac abnormalities. So when you find a major structure abnormalities, even though that patient has a low risk, whatever cell-free DNA test you have done, this is a patient that is a candidate to an invasive test because you need to look for any other uh, uh, chromosomal abnormalities, especially in the one that have an increased NT, the, like the increased NT on the top, a very large NT, especially the, the NT that are above the 99 centiles, which you can consider also as a structural abnormality. So if you, in, in the cases where you have normal cell-free DNA or you don't, you are considering doing a cell-free DNA, but your ultrasound shows you a major structural abnormality or a very large increase um, nuchal translucency, those are the cases where you actually uh, are not going to consider that. Um, <clears throat> we, we've learned that you can see heart, as Professor Julien uh, showed us, you can see the heart in the first trimester. This is just an example of how uh, new technologies can help, the SMI, the Spur Microvascular Imaging uh, by Cano, uh, that can, uh, this is the difference between using and not using. Uh, this is the identification of all the major uh, sections or all the major uh, views you have to do to assess the, the heart in the first trimester without the SMI in blue, the blue bar, you can see all of them in one patient uh, in 81% in a series that we have done, a study that we just finished and we are writing now the paper. And with the SMI, you can increase the detection to about 96%. The visual, not detection, sorry, the visualization of those structures. Uh, so the, uh, but there is still, for the ones that don't want to look at the heart, you can use some markers that can actually still use the markers that can help you to assess and to screen, not to detect, but to screen for, for example, cardiac abnormalities. And here, you can still remain the importance of looking at nuchal translucency, tricuspid flow, and ductus venosus. This is a screening test, with a publication also from the group of Professor Nicolaidis uh, a few years ago, that showed that by looking at the NT, or the tricuspid regurgitation, or uh, the reverse A wave in the ductus venosus, you can reach detection rate um, of about 58, nearly 60% for major cardiac abnormalities with a false positive rate of about 8%, which means that you will detect in your population about 60% of your major cardiac abnormalities uh, and your cardiologist will see about 8% of your population. If you think that is too much for your cardiologist to see, you increase your threshold, you use an increase NT in of about uh, above the 99 centile, you will remain with about 53% detection rate for a 4% uh, false positive rate. So that is still, there is still a role in looking at fetal structure, there is still a role in looking at the fetal markers that, uh, as, as we know, and you can reach, if you like to look at tricuspid flow, you know how to look at the four chambers view, and therefore you, you are used to say if the, that four chambers view is normal or not, and if you consider that as part of your screening test, you can increase your detection rate to about 75%. Um, <clears throat> that is, the other role of the ultrasound comes for, from, for, from the preeclampsia screening. Uh, we know that preeclampsia is important during pregnancy, and we also know that preeclampsia is important for that woman even after pregnancy for her whole life. This data show us uh, that women that had preeclampsia, they have increased risk, the, the graphs here on this side, they have increased risk of all these events, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, uh, stroke and embolism. They have an increased risk for their whole life. 
but if you, and, and when you take hypertension on its own, you will see that you think that, well, that woman has an increased risk of developing uh, chronic hypertension, but she will develop chronic hypertension when she's like 250 years old. Uh, that's not true. I mean, the, the, the risk of having chronic hypertension, like within the two years after she delivered that baby, increases in 30%. And this is even more, uh, the, the risk is even higher if the preeclampsia is an early preeclampsia. The risk is 45% against 25% if the, it is a late preeclampsia. So it is important to predict uh, the very early preeclampsia because nowadays we know that we can predict and we can uh, safely prevent. The, there is the importance on the ultrasound, of course, is within the, the use of the uterine artery PI. Those are the, the criteria. You, you can find it in the Fetal Medicine Foundation website. You can also find uh, in the, the ISWOG uh, guidelines. And we know that the higher is the PI, of the uterine artery PI within the first trimester, higher is the chance that the, will, the woman will develop preeclampsia early that will require a, 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 an early birth, a premature birth. And on the base of uh, the, um, the maternal characteristics or maternal history plus um, uterine artery PI, your detection rate for the early preeclampsia, the, the, pre the preterm preeclampsia, the ones that will require birth delivery before 37 weeks, it's about 58%. It is 58%. Uh, and the late preeclampsia is 35%. And of course, there are other players, other markers that you can include. You all know that. That's not the topic of, the, of this session. But you can increase your detection rate by adding other markers, like the uh, mean arterial pressure. You increase your detection rate for premature preeclampsia to about 68%. And if you have PLGF, you can increase your detection rate to about 75%. So there is a role in ultrasound in detecting, still, there is a role in ultrasound for many things especially for, for detecting fetal defects and also as part of the screening for, for preeclampsia. If, I, if uh, we could spend here half a day talking about the role of ultrasound in first trimester in the cell-free DNA area, because a part of detecting trisomy 21, 18, and 13, every other thing that we still do, it doesn't really change. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jeddah. We have time for one question before we have a mass exodus. For you, Jader, which is the most significant ultrasound finding? If you have one to keep in your mind, which one? The, the, sorry? The most significant ultrasound findings uh, to uh, think about aneuploidies or... Um... Okay, so if you... If you... <clears throat> That's a tricky question. You can say that from the marker's point of view, we, we will remain with the uterine artery PI as, as one of the most important ones because it plays an important role in, in, in the screening for preeclampsia. Uh, when you talk about screening things. Um, and then if you look for nucleotranslucency, it is still helps you for, of course, for aneuploidies, but for structural abnormalities as well. So I think I cannot say one, but I have to say two. NT and, 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 and the uterine RTPI. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you to Jetta, thank you thank to you. our speakers, Antonio and Yelani, and thank you all for attending the Canon Symposium today. So enjoy the rest of the Congress, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>